I'm Fred Weston, one of the editors of the In Defense of Marxism website, a website published by the International Marxist Tendency, which is an international current uh, present in many countries fighting for the genuine ideas of Marxism. One of the fronts on, on which we battle for the genuine ideas of socialism is the, is the um, theoretical front. And an important part of that is a defense of Marxist philosophy, uh, the philosophical outlook of Marxism, basically dialectical materialism. Now, part of this campaign uh, is the publishing of a book by Alan Woods on the history of philosophy. Alan Woods is a member of the editorial board of In Defense of Marxism, a key uh, figure in our movement and has written many books on many different subjects. One of which was uh, a book called Reason and Revolt, which is the application of um, Marxist philosophy, Marxist outlook, to modern science. That book was published back in 1995. The book we're about to produce now started out actually as chapters as of that book but that would have made the book a bit more cumbersome, a bit too long. We decided to separate it out uh, into a, a book specifically on the actual history of philosophy from a Marxist point of view. That, what, that is what this book is. It looks at the development of philosophical thinking from ancient times, from the ancient Greeks in particular, right through to the Renaissance, to the Enlightenment, and up to the times of Marx and Engels. Now, you can ask yourselves, why do we need a book on philosophy? Why do we need philosophy at all? Most people think they don't have a philosophy, uh, but in reality they do. Um, what it means is they don't have a conscious idea of uh, philosophical thinking, but they do apply what is an outlook on society. And if you don't have a specific philosophy that you've developed or uh, tried to delve into it and to look into it, most people tend to um, adopt the general outlook that exists in society. The outlook of any given society is determined in the last analysis by who dominates that society, the ruling class. The ruling class have an interest, therefore, in people thinking. What you've often heard, nothing ever changes. You can't change things. Um, it's always been like this. There's always been rich and poor. There's always been injustices. There's nothing you can do about it. And the message basically is don't try to change society. Just get on with your lives. But um, society does change. And even the, the ruling class of today, the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class, didn't always think like this. When they were a class which was aspiring to power, i.e. removing or, or at least sidelining the, uh, the rural landed aristocracy, the feudal aristocracy, um, to create the basis for the development of modern capitalism with themselves as the ruling class. They had more progressive uh, views. They looked uh, for the most advanced ideas in order to move society forward because they were moving forward in society. Having placed themselves in the position of power and being the ruling class, of course, now they have an interest in preserving that power and with it comes a philosophical outlook which says, as things are, they cannot be changed, just accept it, which means accept the fact that they are the dominant class and they will stay in power. But um, Marxists don't accept that outlook. We understand that society does change, it evolves, and as it changes, and as the changes accumulate at a certain point for society to move forward, a radical change in society is involved, and that means removing the ruling class which is in power. That's why we have an interest in moving forward, and they have an interest in keeping things as they are. But um, the, the fact is that um, the more humanity discovers how things work, how, how science develops, and the greater scientific discoveries, the more it's abundantly clear 
that things do move and do change in the way Marx's philosophy um, indicates. First of all, things change, they don't stand still. Um, but how they change is also another question. Is it just gradual small changes? Or do we have uh, an accumulation of small changes and then an eruption of very rapid change, basically revolutionary change? Um, we think that, that nature moves like that, society moves like that. And uh, as Marxists, we, we um, don't sit back thinking how surprising developments are or how shocking things can be. We expect the changes, we expect the shocks, we expect the surprises because that's the way things actually uh, develop. Now, the book looks at two fundamental divisions in philosophical thinking, materialism and idealism. Now, to make things clear, when we talk about materialism, we're not talking about the common understanding of that word, which is the greed, the desire for greater uh, material um, benefits. And idealism stands for having ideals about changing society. It's the opposite. Materialism, in a philosophical point of view, is we accept the material world as real. It's out there, independent of us, and we can study it and understand it. Idealism basically says that thought comes first. It's thinking about things that comes first. The ultimate expression of that is the figure of God who gives everything existence by thinking about it. We're told that we exist because God um, thinks about us and gives us that existence. But um, another, another aspect of this is, um, you know, what is consciousness? Uh, the idealists regard consciousness as something external to the body. In effect, there's a kind of soul living in this body. Uh, we as Marxists understand that, that consciousness is actually an expression of matter itself. It's matter organized in a certain way. It, re it evolves over billions of years, eventually evolving the brain, the human brain, the ability to think uh, in abstract terms and to develop ideas and to analyze and study the world around us. For, therefore, for us, thinking and consciousness is part of the physical body, not something separate to it. Um, this division between materialists and idealists goes back thousands of years. It was present in the ancient Greeks. Alan Woods goes into that in his book. Many of the discoveries they made were buried uh, in the subsequent years with the collapse of the ancient civilizations, um, buried for, during the Dark Ages under the domination of the Catholic Church and all the backwardness that came with that. But then came the Renaissance, the Enlightenment and a revival of um, materialism in, in, and scientific rational thinking. Um, but materialism that re-emerged initially had a mechanical aspect to it. The, 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 the materialists accepted the real world, but they saw it as something static and unmoving. Um, Marxists understand that the material world is real, but it's moving, it's changing, and it changes according to certain laws which can be developed by analyzing science, analyzing history, analyzing society. Um, where does the dialectical approach come from? It comes from Hegel, who took it back from the ancient Greeks, um, but Hegel thought of it as uh, the way thought develops. Marx and Engels took the dialectics of Hegel, combined it with the materialism of the previous period, and developed what we today call dialectical materialism, i.e. we look at the material world, but we look at it in its motion, in its change, what it was, what it is, and what it will inevitably uh, become. Um, so the book is a history of philosophy from ancient times up to Marx and Engels um, through Hegel. Um, after Marx and Engels, in effect, bourgeois philosophy is a philosophy which is aimed at denying rational scientific thinking. The reason for that is that the class which expresses those ideas has become um, reactionary. Um, it has to justify its own existence and therefore 
has to present itself as the final goal of all of human history. You know, all this talk about the end of history. History ends with capitalism because it's supposed to be the best thing and the ultimate objective. That means there's no room for rational scientific thinking because it would mean drawing the inevitable conclusion that capitalism is merely one phase in the development of human society and that it has a beginning but it also has an end and it prepares the conditions for a new society and that society can only be a society based not on the way capitalism works but on rational planning of the economy using the resources that humanity has accumulated through thousands of years of class society in a much more rational way to the benefit of um, the working people of the world. So this book is a historical account basically how philosophy developed over the centuries and how it eventually produced um, at its peak the ideas of Marx and Engels who, th who took the best of all the previous thinkers and elaborated a new philosophical outlook which is Marxism which is the philosophy of Marxism which if understood studied and absorbed allows us to analyze society in a, in a scientific rational way and to present an alternative to the society that we live in. This book is not the kind of book you will see produced in a university or in the academic world. It is um, a book which defends the ideas of a class which is not in power, of a class which is oppressed, of a class which is exploited. That's why it hasn't got any rich backers and that's why we're appealing to you, the workers, the youth, who are struggling to change society, who want a better world, who want to understand why we're in the mess that we're in, why there is such a crisis, why there is such injustice um, in the world, and what can be done about it. You start by having the correct approach and the correct method of analysis. That's what this book is about. We ask you to pre-order it, buy it, promote it, organize reading groups, read it, study it, and make it part of your uh, weaponry, let's say, in the class struggle.